How's it going everyone? It's Red Effect. Today we will be taking a look at M1A1 Abrams and its performance in Gulf War. But first, a brief history of the tank. M1A1 Abrams is a follow-up of the revolutionary M1 Abrams tank which entered service in 1980. M1 Abrams was the first US tank to feature new laminate armor, nicknamed Chubham armor, which was invented by the British in 1972. M1 Abrams had a 105mm gun present in older models, such as M60A3, but was upgraded to fire more powerful rounds. No sooner had the M1 entered production than the army decided to press ahead with the M256 120mm gun, a simplified copy of the German Rhine metal weapon. By this time, it was obvious that the 105mm gun would be inadequate to deal with the newer generation of Soviet tanks such as T-64B and T-80B. The first M1A1 pilots with the 120mm gun were delivered in March 1981. These pilots incorporated a variety of other improvements, most notably an improved armor package. The armor protection for the M1A1 against Armor piercing thin stabilized discarding C, but is equivalent to 600 mm rolled homogous armor compared to 470 mm for the M1, and 700 mm against heat compared to 650 mm for the basic M1. These features, minus the 120 mm gun, were incorporated into the M1 production line with the confusingly named EPM1 improved performance M1. 894 of the latter were delivered between October 1984 and May 1986. The 120mm version of the Abrams was type classified as M1A1 in August 1984, and the first production tanks were completed in August 1985. During the late 1980s, development of laminate armor packages for the Abrams continued, including a configuration using a depleted uranium, that is, metallic uranium consisting of isotopes that emit little or no radiation. The principal advantage of uranium is its weight and density, which is about double that of lead. Depleted uranium was employed in a third generation of armor on the M1A1, leading to a variant dubbed the M1A1HA, where HA stands for heavy armor. Besides being incorporated into the production tanks, starting in October 1988, the heavy armor package could also be retrofitted to existing tanks. Let's take a look at the stats of M1A1. M1A1 was equipped with powerful M256 120mm gun, which could fire M829 and M829A1 APFSDS projectiles, where M829A1 nicknamed Silver Bullet, which used a depleted uranium penetrator, was preferred ammunition for tank fighting in Gulf War. The penetration of Silver Bullet was 570mm at 2km and 670mm at point blank, which was more than enough to penetrate Iraqi T-72 tanks, which I already made a video about, link will be in the description down below. The tank would also fire M830 heat projectile, which was preferred for light armored vehicles since the Sabot round was too powerful to do significant damage to them. The armor of M1A1 was, as previously mentioned, 600mm against APFSDS and 700mm against heat. Now, the heavy armor variant had far superior armor of 800mm against APFSDS projectiles and 1300mm against heat. Both were impossible to penetrate on the front by any projectiles Iraqis could fire at them. The engine was a holdup from M1 Abrams. It was the AGT-1500 gas turbine engine which gave Abrams power to weight ratio of 23 horsepower per ton. But as any other gas turbine engine, the fuel consumption was very high. US tankers found that M1A1 Abrams could operate for about a day on a single load of fuel compared to about three days of the earlier M60A3 tank. The fire control system utilized a digital ballistic computer 
designed to be operated with minimal training, using automatic data inputs to improve overall gun accuracy with minimal intention from the gunner. It would automatically input data from wind and gun sensors, as well as data on tracking rates for lead corrections based on the turret traverse. The gunner would manually enter other data such as air temperature, ammunition temperature, barometric pressure and tube wear, but this could be done prior to the engagement to minimize the need for attention during combat. The gunner's primary sight was configured for both a 3 power wide field of view and surveillance and target acquisition and 10 power narrow field of view for aiming. The most substantial difference between the fire control system for the M1A1 Abrams and the Iraqi T-72M1 was the provision in the M1A1 of the integrated thermal imaging subsystem, two generations more advanced than the T-72M1's active infrared system. The M1A1 had an auxiliary sight, a conventional telescopic sight for use in the event of failure of the primary equipment. The M1A1 had a crew of four, Tank Commander or TC, Gunner, Loader and Driver, overstationed in the turret except for the driver, who was positioned in the center of the front hull. In the turret, the loader was on the left and the gunner and TC were on the right. The tank commander was positioned behind the gunner and was responsible for leading the tank in combat. The TC was also provided with an optical adjunct from the gunner's primary sight and the commander could aim the tank's weapon and fire it, if necessary, using these override controls. The commander's station included a 50 caliber heavy machine gun on a remote control mount. The commander also had controls for activating the smoke grenade launchers on the front side of the turret, which were used for defense. The gunner's primary sight, GPS, located immediately in front of him, comprised an integrated day-night sighting system with laser rangefinder and digital ballistic computer. The gunner's inputs included selecting whether to engage the target with the main gun or the coaxial machine gun, and identifying the main gun ammunition type to ensure the ballistic computers set the proper offsets. The gunner's controls were operated using palm switches on the Cadillac grips, which allowed him to turn the turret right or left, elevate or depress the main gun, and trigger the main gun or coaxial machine gun. The loader armed the main gun on the instructions of the TC and had to be quite strong and agile as the rounds weighted more than 65 pounds each. The main ammunition storage was in the turret bustle behind blast doors with two 16-round racks on either side and one or two two-round ready racks at the extremities. There was an additional three-round ready rack in front of the loader in the left hull, as is the main gun ammunition reserved in the left rear bustle was by means of the blast door actuated by the gunner using a knee switch which let him keep his hands free during the loading process. The loader's hatch was fitted with an M2407 62mm machine gun for close-in defense of the tank. The tank radio was located in front of the loader station. The driver was isolated from the rest of the crew in the forward hull. The M1A1 driver station represented a considerable departure from earlier US tank designs. Instead of sitting in a conventional seat, the driver lay on his back in a semi-prone position. However, the seat could be raised to let the driver sit up when operating with his head outside the hatch, or lowered to a more prone position when driving buttoned up. Now, let's talk about M1A1 in Gulf War. US Army had deployed 1,956 M1A1 tanks to Saudi Arabia, 733 of which were M1A1 and 1,233 were M1A1HA tanks, plus 528 other tanks in war reserve stock not attached to combat units. G-Day, signifying the start of the ground campaign, began at dawn on February 24, 1991, with the assault by 18th Airborne Corps. Of the 36 Abrams battalions or squadrons in Operation Desert Storm, 7 served with 18th Airborne Corps on the left flank, 25 with 7th Corps in the center 
and four with the marines on the right flank along the Kuwaiti border. Our 7 Corps was the one that faced the Iraqi T-72 tanks. The primary mission of 7 Corps was to rapidly breach the Iraqi frontier defenses, reach through the Iraqi desert to the west of the Kuwaiti frontier, then envelop and destroy the Republican Guards Division serving as the Iraqi Army's main reserve. The first two days Abrams tanks regiments saw intense fighting with Iraqi tanks of which the majority were T-55 tanks and just a small number of T-72 tanks, followed by MTLB armored transporters. What followed in the late afternoon of February the 26th was the famous Battle of 73 Easting. When 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment attacked the Iraqi forces on 73 Easting, some of the tank crew were huddled down in trenches due to earlier attacks in the area and never managed to get back into their vehicles. Other tanks did try to fight back, but their crews could barely see the attacking American force, and the tanks failed to properly adjust for range, with their saber rounds hitting the ground well in front of the US Army vehicles. As the smoke cleared, it revealed that the 18 M1A1 tanks and 24 M3A1 Bradleys had destroyed more than 30 dug-in T-72 tanks and 12 BMP ones with no loss to themselves. A stunned Tavakalna tank battalion commander said, When the air campaign started, they had 39 tanks. After 38 days of the air battle, I had 32 tanks. After 20 minutes against them, I had zero tanks. On February the 27th commenced the Battle of Medina Ridge. The Medina Armored Division's 2nd Armored Brigade had established a reverse slope defense, however, the site had been poorly chosen. As the ridge that the br brigade was using to ambush the advancing US force was too far away from its 125mm guns to reach, as the Iraqis had apparently not bothered to verify the distance. The weather was overcast and wet, with visibility at only about 1500 meters. The US 1st Armored Division's 2nd Iron Brigade crested the prize shortly after noon on February the 27th. The Iraqis were unaware of their arrival, lacking a proper security zone and unable to see the Abrams due to the weather. US forces attacked at 11.45 and the first encounter was at 12.17, where several T-72s and BMPs were spotted. The range to the targets was from 2800 and 3200 meters, and US tanks managed to score hits from that range with no issues, although the weather made the Iraqi tanks invisible to the naked eye. After the first few rounds, the crews began to notice a series of flashes from the Iraqi positions. But lacking the thermal imaging systems, Iraqis could only blind fire at the flashes they saw from US tanks but their shots often fell a kilometer away from the American tanks. The BMPs fired ATGM missiles at Abrams tanks from that range, but being able to see them, US tanks destroyed the BMPs before the rockets even reached them. Some BMPs hopelessly tried to outflank Abrams tanks, but failed in doing so. 35 minutes after the engagement started, US forces called in close air support and started assaulting the remaining Iraqi tanks. Moving forward, the Iraqi vehicles hidden from sight by the ground suddenly came into view. Many were BMP-1s and SA-13s, where few were T-72s which abandoned their positions in panic. Nevertheless, all were destroyed. When US tanks were 600 meters away from Iraqi defensive line, they noticed white flags coming out of trenches. Those were the Iraqi troops who wanted to surrender, and so the engagement came to an end. A similar situation also happened where 1st US Brigade engaged the Iraqi tanks from 4000 meters while they were refueling. By the end of February the 27th, the 1st Armored Division had largely destroyed the Medina Division, knocking out 186 tanks and 127 armored infantry vehicles. The Gulf War came to an end. Abrams tanks did suffer some losses, but more Abrams tanks were destroyed by friendly fire than Iraqi action. 
On later accounts it would appear that at least 7 Abrams were hit by T-72 gunfire. One was temporarily disabled when a hit near the rear of the turret ignited crew stowage, and another may have been disabled by a shot through the thin armor of the engine compartment. However, no hits penetrated the frontal armor. Iraqi T-72 losses have never been tallied with any precision, but were probably in the neighborhood of 750 to 800 tanks. Total Iraqi tank losses to all causes were from 3200 to 3900, plus 2400 to 2750 other types of armored vehicles lost. These T-72 losses were not exclusively to engagements against the M1A1 Abrams tank, but a significant portion were due to direct combat and non-air attacks. That is it, thanks for watching. If you think I made a mistake somewhere, feel free to correct me in the comment section down below. And I will see you all in the next video. Have a nice day.